Peter Howard. Harvest Plus just organized the second global conference on biofortification, which was hosted by the government of Rwanda in Kigali. More than 300 global leaders in agriculture, health, and food and nutrition security were in attendance. Can you tell us, what were the major takeaways from the conference? What commitments were made? Well, the, I think the main uh, outcome of the conference was that we got together a wide group of stakeholders uh, that we want to engage in the deployment of biofortified crops. In terms of commitments, um, I think one of the major commitments was uh, given by Frank Reiserman, who's the CEO of the CGIR Consortium, and he pledged that uh, we would mainstream the breeding for minerals and vitamins at the CGR Center. Um, in addition, uh, we had the Ministers of Health and the Minister of Agriculture from three different countries in Africa, so Nigeria, uh, Uganda, and of course the host uh, Rwanda. And they all expressed support uh, for the deployment of biofortified crops. Uh, we're quite pleased that even though we initially targeted just one biofortified crop for each one of those countries, now they're asking for for other uh, other crops to be introduced in their countries as well. In your introduction to the topic, you spoke of biofortification as a viable option for farmers and other stakeholders. What initial strategies are there for scaling up and to expand the deliver delivery of nutritious foods? How would smallholder farmers access biofortified crops and seeds? Well, it's really uh, two broad strategies. First, when you have iron and zinc in the crop, you can't see the iron, you can't taste the zinc. They're essentially invisible. So the basic strategy with those types of crops is to piggyback on high yield, uh, the best agronomic properties. And that's already happening with uh, beans in Rwanda, which is why we, we held the conference there, because we wanted to uh, show people the progress that we had made in Rwanda. So our high iron beans are higher yielding than the normal beans that uh, Rwandan farmers grow. And we've all already, between a third and a half of Rwandan bean growing farm households have obtained a pack of seed. Uh, have purchased a pack of seed and are now testing out the beans. And uh, we've heard stories about wholesalers coming across the borders from Uganda, from Tanzania, bringing the beans uh, you know, across to those countries, I presume because of their high yield. Um, the second strategy is with our pro-vitamin A crop. So we have an orange maize that we're introducing into Zambia. Uh, Zambians uh, are used to eating white maize. We're introducing uh, high pro-vitamin A, a yellow cassava in Nigeria. Nigerians are used to eating white cassava. And we've already had experience with the orange sweet potato, where most Africans are eating white sweet potato. Uh, in those cases, again, you need to have high yield, uh, but you have to provide the farmers and the consumers the information about why it's yellow, why it's orange. So we have to provide the information about the dangers of vitamin A deficiency and that these crops can help protect the children uh, from these deficiencies. And uh, we found that uh, once people are given this information, once mothers know this information, uh, they're, they're readily um, uh, they're ready to switch to the yellow varieties or the orange varieties because they're basically the same price but with an added value with the, with the vitamin A in the crop. So we're investigating ways of providing that information at the lowest cost possible. So we're still, uh, we're still working that out. What, what are those best communication strategies? The biofortification process involves the use of plant breeding techniques, which is common in the agricultural sphere. Why then has it taken this long to become mainstream? Well, it's, um, you know, it was a hard sell in the beginning. When we started in 2003, uh, we knew that it would take uh, a minimum of eight years to do the breeding, to put the high nutrient levels and high yielding background. And then on top of that, once you finish the breeding, you have to submit the varieties to the varietal release committee to get approval for breeding. So, for example, our high zinc wheat in Pakistan have to be tested for three years by government authorities before they can be released. 
So our high zinc wheat will be released in Pakistan only in 2015, even though we already had the variety uh, developed in 2012. So we're just getting started on the uh, on the scale up. We've only uh, in the last two years really we've only had the varieties uh, that have been released. And initially, you have a small amount of seed, and so you have to multiply the seed as quickly as possible. That, that goes much faster for the grain than it does for the root crop. Um, but, uh, you know, our best example, again, is Rwanda. Beans, you can multiply very quickly, and so just two years after release, we've reached already between one-third and one-half of bean-growing households. So now that there is promising evidence that biofortification is a viable proposition. How exactly could biofortification help decision makers in developing nutri nutrition sensitive agriculture and food policies for nutrition? Well, we feel that the ultimate solution to um, the, the mineral and vitamin deficiency problem, the ultimate solution is for people to have varied diets. Uh, the, where people have high enough income that they can buy the kinds of foods that, uh, you know, that we in developed countries all enjoy. Uh, that's what we all want to see happen in developing countries. But that's going to take uh, several decades before incomes go up to that point. So in the meantime, what the biofortified crops do is they provide uh, more iron, more zinc, more provitamin A in the staple food crop that the farmers and consumers are already eating in large quantities. So it's something that helps to reduce the deficiencies in those, uh, those two minerals and that one vitamin along the way to the ultimate goal, which is for people to have a uh, quality diet. Now, because the varieties are high yielding, just as high yielding as the normal crop, uh, they still contribute to uh, increased productivity, rising income. Um, but at the same time, they meet the primary goal of uh, agriculture, which is to provide uh, better nutrition, better health for the population. The members of the Global Donor Platform all have their own projects and strategies geared towards smallholder farmers. Would you see your method as a complementary process or a competitive in nature? Any last message for donors? Well, whatever, whatever your strategies are for introducing um, uh, better food staple crops to smallholder farmers. Uh, we're just trying to replace one for one. Uh, if you have, a, say, a drought resistant maize, uh, we want that drought resistant maize to also be biofortified. Um, it's, uh, it's an added value. It's also high yielding. So uh, we, I would see it as uh, highly complementary to anything uh, that's being done. I'll, I'll give an example with the World Food Program. They have a Purchase for Progress uh, program where they're helping to increase the uh, productivity of smallholder farmers, and then they provide uh, the demand. They buy the output from the farmers and store the output in their warehouses for emergency situations. So now they're working with uh, biofortified crops. So instead of working with regular beans in Rwanda now, they're working with uh, distributing biofortified beans. And uh, the main message is that uh, we have several crops available now, and we want to get them out to as many countries as possible. And we're working for uh, partners uh, from many different sectors to help us in the deployment of the biofortified crops.